Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, we're excited that you're here and we're excited to be here. I'm going to be um, presenting and then Bradley, um, you can see in the video here, is going to be helping me answer questions. <laughs> um, and Bradley's been around forever, so he knows a lot, a lot about cranes. So um, the presentation will begin uh, now. Um, if you have any questions, um, please put them in the question box. Um, don't raise your hand because we uh, won't be paying attention to that. And we'll just um, um, answer as many questions as we can behind uh, at the end of the presentation. So thank you for being with us and let's get going. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about craniacs. I'm Lara Jordan and Bradley's with us, as we mentioned. And so what is a craniac? Um, any ideas? I googled craniac and it's a new mini game craniac series. So if you are here to uh, talk about that, um, we won't be. But stay around because um, we're going to talk about craniac. And craniacs is someone who loves to study and learn and appreciates cranes. Now, over um, the human race's lifespan, if you like, we have loved cranes on and off. Um, we've drawn cranes in um, cave paintings. I mean, they date back years. And so there's a strong emotional tie that people have with cranes. And this is expressed in all kinds of art even tattoos you can see here, um, symbols, and the symbols represent, um, the symbols represent um, happiness, um, marital bliss, long life. Cranes represent so many positive things in, in culture um, that people get really excited about them. In Uganda and Nigeria, crown cranes are the national birds. And of course, here in South Africa, the blue crane is our national bird. Often wedding garments of Japan um, will have cranes on them for marital bliss. And this is um, it's, it's just extraordinary how much cranes evoke in people. Even in written word, um, we can see that um, stories and the things that people write, poetry like Aldo uh, Leopold, um, ha it, it, cranes evoke a lot of passion. So David Attenborough, one of my favorites, um, was quoted in saying, cranes are magnificent dancers, international travelers, and great ambassadors for conservation worldwide. What birds could be more deserving of our help and protection? And as craniacs, I'm sure you're in agreement of the sentiment that David shares there. So come along with us, we're going to journey, and what we hope to achieve is to help your understanding of cranes and how they are in the world and what affects them and the way they live. Because as craniacs, we want to be able to support the cranes living in the world that we live in. So we're going to just look briefly at the, the cranes all over the world, and then we're going to just focus a little bit more on the three crane species, the crown crane, the blue crane, and the wattle crane that we will find and see in South Africa. Okay, so where in the world do cranes live? They live on five continents, North America, Africa, Europe, Asia, and Australia. Why they don't live in South America, Antarctica? Nobody really knows. Perhaps it's, um, they just never flew there. Um, it's a bit of a mystery. And I have asked a few world-renowned crane people and I have not had an answer yet. So we can keep investigating that one together. Cranes are a very ancient uh, form of bird. Scientists have discovered fossils of crane bones that are over 25 million years old. That's very old. So on the five continents, we can see four cranes uh, can be found in Africa, two in North America, um, and in Asia and Europe, about uh, six, and three on Australia. Now, the, the family, the taxonomic family that cranes come from is one of the most threatened in the world. Um, here's all the 15 species of the cranes. And we can see that their red list status, status um, shows you um, 
the, the, how many species um, are endangered, critically endangered. This is how threatened they are in the world. So we have one species, the Siberian crane, which is critically endangered. Three species, including the grey crowned crane here in South Africa, which is in danger. Uh, four species that are of least concern, which, um, and then seven species that are vulnerable. And the blue crane and the wattle crane are both considered vulnerable. But that being said, the wattle crane, there's only 359 on the last aerial survey count of this species left in South Africa. So we definitely have our work cut out looking after cranes. Okay, so why are cranes built the, the way they are? When we start to understand the biology of cranes, we can start to understand how they live in our world. So, one, cranes have great eyesight. They need that so that they can see predators, preferably before they can see them. Now, predators could be um, jackal or any kind of animal that eats meat. So, we, they, they're really, really important. And if you're a small crane, you would need to also know, uh, see birds of prey that are in the air over the, uh, above you before they see you. So they have excellent eyesight. Another feature you'll find on the crane's faces is the red patch of their skin. Not every crane species has this, but most of them do. This red patch helps you know how the crane is feeling. So as the red gets redder and redder and flushes, we call it flushing, then that's um, a sign that the crane is um, getting a little bit upset with you and is warning you that it's not happy with what's happening. Um, obviously, cranes have very large wings because some of them fly and migrate long distances, but also because their bodies are quite large, they need quite large wings. And a crane's weight ranges between two to eight kilos. So obviously we're gonna need quite big wings to get off the ground and to sustain the body in the air. So cranes also have long legs and that's because they, like, they, they live in wetlands and grasslands. And so they need long legs to wade through the, grass, the wetlands, but also to walk among agricultural fields and grasslands where they forage and live. And also, obviously, if you've got long legs, you're gonna need a long leg so you can reach the floor to probe and so you can eat. And so cranes also have long necks. But in addition to this, their vocalization um, is, is in the windpipe and is coiled into their chest. So because they have such a long leg, long neck is why they actually have such loud calls. Okay, and then the beaks, the feeding instruments. So we use knives and forks and they have long beaks um, for probing. So for example, the wattle crane will po poke and prod the wetland ground and pick up the roots and the seeds that are there. And so they need long beaks for doing the, um, that type of probe, that type of feeding. Okay, so here's um, crown cranes and wattle cranes in their natural environment. So the wattles spend a lot of time in the wetland area. They roost in wetlands, as do uh, blue cranes. But the crown cranes, also they're more gregarious and they also, you'll see them a lot in the agricultural fields as well. So you can see that their long legs help them walk through stubble and then grasslands. But also um, crown cranes, they have a little bit of an extra toe at the back, which means that this is um, one of the species that can perch. Whereas the blue and the wattle crane can't perch, um, they have to roost for safety in water. Okay, so why do we get such a positive response from people around cranes? Well, one of the reasons is they love to dance. And so one of the questions we can ask ourselves is why do they dance? So often people think cranes are dancing when they are um, threatening behavior. Um, so no animal in the world actually wants to fight with another animal. So that's why they've devised lots of different ways to scare off other people and other animals, because fighting causes possibility of damage or death. So in the cranes, they um, have a range of different postures and movements, and that um, helps deter um, anyone that is coming towards them. And so 
they do that by using their wings and bowing and ruffling and, and they're basically communicating to each other, hey, this is my territory, go away. The other reason cranes dance is because um, they're a pair. That means that they're male and female mating. And they do a lot of dancing to reinforce bonding. So they like to dance together. And you can see here the crown cranes are just bobbing and dancing together in that bottom picture. Also, the birds um, use vocalization to, uh, to also communicate to the world and to each other. And one of the things that they do when they're dancing with one another is vocalizing. And you can see, I'm just going to play a little recording. Hopefully you'll hear it. Uh, oh. I'll just play it again. So these are a pair of blue cranes. And that's a unison call. And that's also part of the dancing and bonding display. And this is also something that invokes such passion in people. Um, and you can see here in these blue cranes, they're just dancing here and throwing sticks and throwing feathers is something oh, that they often do in pair bonding. So it's a very strong wind day. But it's great to see them dancing. And the grace with which they do it and use the wind is one of the reasons why people love cranes. Oh, sorry about that. OK. So the gray crown crane is one of the most primitive of cranes. It dates back 56 to 33 million years ago, which is a very long time ago. There were at least 11 species of crane previously, but they most, uh, mostly died out, only leaving the gray and the black crown crane. Um, it's un unclear as to why so many died out, but it's thought to relate to the temperature. Then we have our national bird, the blue crane. In culture, the Kosovo and Zulu tribes used the blue crane feathers um, in historically for, um, for, for warriors and for royalty. And then the beautiful wattle crane. You can see here the wattle crane has um, wattles under its chin. And those change in, and express the mood that the bird is feeling. So if the wattle shrinks, the crane is nervous. And if they're ex or, or excited, if they're elongated, they're excited. The wattle crane is the largest um, of the African cranes. Okay, so when do they breed in South Africa? So the blue and the grey crown cranes breed uh, in the summer, and they lay the blue crowns lay two eggs, and the crown crane usually laid three, but they can have been known to lay four, and then they reared those chicks together. They generally um, with their parents for five months, and then they learn to with other juveniles, other young birds, and they go to a floater flock with their parents and generally start breeding between three to five years. The longevity of the crane, these the smaller cranes, is around 12 years, but it can go up to 20. And in captivity, it's um, been known that they live as long as 34 years. The wattle crane, being a larger crane, um, has lives for up to uh, 40 years or so. And the oldest um, lived, uh, oldest age, <laughs> the bird with the has lived up to 86 years in captivity. It's the oldest bird recorded. These birds only lay one to two eggs, but will only ever rear one chick. And um, they stay with the parents a bit longer than the other two species. They stay together for seven months. And then they too will go and join the uh, wild flock. The wattle cranes um, start breeding, it uh, has been recorded as young as two, but generally it's between four to six years. So here you can see an example of the wattle crane nest on the right, and then the blue crane nest on the left. And the wattle cranes um, and the crown cranes make their nests in wetlands, and so very wetland dependent. 
But the old is both, so all crowns and wattle and blues will use wetland areas for roosting as well. So wetlands play an important role within this relationship. The, crown crane, the blue cranes generally make scrapes within agricultural lands, um, and you can see the difference here. Now, obviously, they have to camouflage. You can see the color of the eggs is to camouflage to prevent the eggs being eaten. And so one of the uh, key roles within uh, incubating and, and rearing is that they can communicate with each other if there's a threat. So I should just play a blue crane th threat here. And wattle. Oh. Oh. Okay, so they alarm call to one another to warn there is danger. And so if you're walking out and you hear these calls, they might be alarming because they're seeing you coming. So the more you start to understand their calls, the more you understand what's happening in their world. Okay, so the eggs are, um, this is a wattle crane chick um, that's hatching, um, it hatched through the Kezadin Crane Foundation, um, and you can see that the, the chicks um, first make a small hole, and then, then they push their way throughout of the egg um, into the hatching process, and this can take about 24 to 48 hours. It's a slow, long process. And the chicks are exhausted when they come out. Then they tend to spend some time on, on the nest with their adults. And um, oh, okay. with the adults. Um, and the, um, yeah, they spend some time and then all their feathers dry off. And then the, when they're all fluffy, they um, are able to uh, get up, leave the nest. They can even swim as early as two days um, after hatching, and sometimes one day. And they have to swim, obviously, because those mounds where they nest are in water. So the only way to get off the nest is to be able to swim off the nest. They are fully feathered. They're able to copy their parents in what the parents do. And this is called mimicry. And so they learn by copying their parents. They also have excellent eyesight and their eyes are open and this is so that they can prevent being predated. So what crane chicks do, because they can't fly for a good uh, 12 weeks, um, 8 to 12 weeks, they're very susceptible to other predators, which is why habitat becomes so important and that they have the correct habitat to eat and be safe. But I'll show you some more pictures about that in a minute. So um, the cranes are also, the crane chicks are also known as cults. They can stand and walk. And this, when, when, a, when a bird hatches and can walk and um, see, these are precocial. They can also eat. These are called precocial birds. Their feathers, you can see here, this is one of the birds. This is a crane chick. And you can see it, it's very similar to the background where it's lived. So it's brown, it's cinnamon colored, so it can hide away nicely. Okay, so this is some work that was done at the Cave and Crane Foundation where they were rearing wattle crane chicks. So we're just going to look and you can see, literally watch and see mimicry happening. So the puppet head you're going to see is training the crane chick um, how to um, do what it needs to do. So we'll just we'll have a little watch of this video. So you can see um, the, the puppet is teaching the chick how to eat. Here, um, you, the, the crane chick copies what the parent is doing all the time. And this is how they learn to forage. This is how they learn to fly. So this bird can't fly yet. So it's learning to jump into the wind. This bird has been encouraged to eat um, the food, probe into the soil. And you can see that the birds, cranes usually fly into the wind because they get a better lift as they open their wings. 
<laughs> and they're just saying that. Now birds, um, when they're young, they, they have to learn how to use those wings and it's very difficult in strong winds. So um, often young birds will get injured because they're practicing their uh, flying skills. It's quite a big task to learn these skills. And that's why it's important that the birds have safe environments in which to do this. Okay, so you can hear and see here as the chicks get bigger that they're still very well camouflaged within the environment. And if they have wetlands, you can see that they can feed and forage in safety of not being seen by other people or predators. However, if something, a threat comes along, then they will hide away. I don't know how clear your screen is, but there is a crane chick hiding away in there. And these next few photos will just show you where it is. If you can see the body there and then the body and the neck. So it really shows you how important the habitats are to cranes growing up. Crane chicks grow very fast for the first two months. And after they hatch, they go about an inch every day. After only three months, they are four to five feet tall. So as some fun, you can work out if you kept growing an inch every day, how tall you would be by the time that you were seven months old. Okay, here's um, a short video with crown crane, uh, two crown crane chicks walking in the field with their parents. And you can hear the call if you listen. They purr, they vocalize and purr to one another. Can you hear it? So they have a contact call when they're together and that's just a quiet purr. And that helps them reassure themselves, especially if they're in the long grasses, that they're okay and they know where each other are. Okay, so here's a wetland and this is um, a wetland of any habitat or landscape. And to try and understand, I hope I've made it clear enough, just to help you understand why it's so important to look after the habitat that cranes live in. Because cranes are a flagship species, they also, um, it mean, flagship means that they are um, the icons of hab certain habitats such as wetlands. So the things that can affect the survival of cranes include the quality of water, the quantity of water, so droughts and floods, will also affect the success of breeding and survival of the population. The places where the, the birds um, are feeding or need to feed. And also, obviously, as we've seen quite a lot in this presentation, the habitat they need for breeding safely. So I hope this has helped you understand how the biology and ecology is really important for understanding how we prevent threats and conserve cranes. Now across the world, cranes have many different threats and each species is a little bit different in each country. And we're going to present some more information on those in wild chats later on specific species. But I hope you've enjoyed this summary and um, we will try and answer any questions you have now. Bradley, are you there? Yes, I'm here, thanks. Yeah, just the question now, the latest one question about if there weren't cranes, what would happen to the ecosystem? Thanks so much, Meredith, for that question. I think a, a good answer there is that they play a very important role in you know, eating, because they're omnivorous, they'll eat you know, from insects, plants, and if they weren't, there'll be far more insects. They actually do a big favor for farmers and if we take them out, obviously be more insects. So they've got a very important role in that. Our next question, thanks so much, Tanya. How are the populations of South Africa doing and are they increasing or decreasing? So blue cranes are definitely increasing because 
in the, the Western Cape population. That's because they're moving more north into the Swartland region, which is north of Cape Town. And from the, also from different studies done across Africa with our estimates, and also from our, how can we say, from what we know at the moment, the gray crown cranes, although they're endangered, there's some, there are some populations increasing. From the wattle crane, that's also been increasing through our aerial surveys that the EWT African Crane Conservation Program colleagues have been doing over KZN. So that's looking good. Just to get to the next question, where are different crane species in South Africa? I like that question because it's always nice to say that you have three populations of blue cranes. I've just mentioned now the largest one being in the Western Cape that is increasing. The second population of blue cranes is found in the Nama Karoo. So that's based in the central South Africa region in unspoilt, untouched, beautiful landscape in the Karoo. The next population is found in the Grassen region, the Grassen biome, and that is Pumalanga, Northern Free State, Northern Guazi Natal. Then moving on to wattle cranes. Wattle cranes are mainly found in Guazi Natal, the biggest population. And that's also in the Grassen region with very good wetlands where they're living in. That could be also something that can move into the, uh, like south of Howick, those regions, and also Nottingham Road, very good place to see wattles. On the Crown Cranes, the largest population is in the northeastern Eastern Cape, that's McClear, Yugi, those parts of the Eastern Cape. A good population was in Natal as well, and you can find them in Pumalanga, in the Vakastrum region, all the way up towards Dalstrom as well. Okay, sorry, back to the explanation of the absence of cranes in South America. So I wish I knew that answer. I've been wondering myself all the time when I look at habitat and I see the habitats on TV, you just see it all the time that it just looks so much like Africa and so many perfect habitats. So one of those questions, I'm just not sure of. It's pretty much the same in a wise and an ostrich in other parts of the world. So it's just obviously that they just haven't, you know, got as far as that. Thanks so much and Wapi for that question. Okay, on the next question, Ali, thanks so much for your question there. Did you ever see louse or tick on the cranes you checked? I have seen some. I don't know if it's mainly louse in some cranes I've, I've seen. Ticks, I haven't. I haven't, no, I haven't gone as far as seeing ticks. I'm not too sure if anyone else has seen ticks. I don't know if Laura, if you want to maybe say anything about ticks. Um, no, I haven't personally, but um, I guess there's no reason why they wouldn't be. Um, but they definitely, um, you, they do get all kinds of mice, bird mice. Um, so that is definitely, obviously the, the cranes can um, have quite a, a strong beak for um, getting rid of ticks. So maybe that's why we don't come across it. Um, but yeah, definitely lots of mice. <laughs> the next question from Aura, thanks so much for your question there. What are some predators for cranes? Cool, okay, we've got the four-legged jackal. That happens at some of your caracals as well, and jackals can often take cranes. From the, because they're large birds, they're also, you know, they are more conspicuous, but because they take a while before they start flying, they're very vulnerable for predation from those animals, those predators we have, the jackals and, and, and caracals. Some other predators, you know, we can get some mongoose, that could maybe take an egg. But we have problems as well with the two-legged jackal sometimes that also take some of the, the chicks in some countries. We're working a lot of different countries to educate people and also to, to do that. I'm just being very extreme because most places, cranes are very well respected and they get a lot of respect from, from people. But when I say that some people will take chicks out for the, for the, mainly for the pet trade in many cases, and that is through education, a lot of people have stopped doing that. Then what they do, the, the chicks will always be with their parents. The parents will, if you saw the video now, the, the parents are often on either side of the chicks and they're very good parents. I think what is brilliant is that the, the blue crane especially does a broken wing act where what happens when they see that there could be a predator coming, they act like they've got a broken wing. And then the the predator will try and attack him instead of the chicks. Very cute thing to watch. It's something I love watching all the time and definitely a, amazing parents to do that. So those are what, what the cranes do as an adaptation to 
avoid predators from taking them. And other predators, I would probably say, you know, that also the way that they hide away in the bushes is to also a way to prevent themselves from being attacked by predators. And I think those are the main predators I've, I've mentioned now as well. So, okay, the next question, Rosemary, thanks so much for your question there. Are there any technological threats to cranes, such as ESCOM lines, cell phone towers? We've got a wonderful partnership, the Endangered Wildlife Trust partnership with ESCOM. And what happens when the cranes do collide with power lines, ESCOM will assist us in marking those lines to make it more visible for for the cranes, it's a fantastic partnership. ESCOM does wonderful work for us. And I've seen very many cases where it's been completely successful. In the work that I've done in the Karoo, for example, I know one site used to be a big hotspot. And then ESCOM marked them with these devices called flappers, also known as bird flight diverters. Cell phone towers, I don't know of any incidences with that. So many power lines and that is being, you know, mitigated through ESCOM's partnership with that. Also, with, on the same subject, I've mentioned now how birds can crash into power lines with the fitting of the devices, the bird flight diverters. But to get onto, for example, the crown cranes, they're the only cranes that can perch onto to power lines in South Africa. So some of them will be standing on power lines. What, in, in that case, ESCOM also has got different insulation sleeves that they fit over the power lines to make it a lot better for reducing the risk of electrocution. So once those insulation sleeves have been fitted, then in, in that case, you, you won't have, you know, electrocutions from them. Okay. Okay, just a comment with regard to South America, it is particular strange they're not considering proximity of Africa and South America to one another at the time of Gondwana land, and cranes have been around for millions of years. Would cranes utilize artificial wetlands if it is possible to build wetlands for new habitats for cranes? I like that because current cranes I've noticed have been quite adaptable because your word artificial wetlands could also be used in the term of those wetlands found next to dams. And in that case, you have like an artificial wetland forming. And, you know, that's something that, that I've seen in, in some cases. Very good explanation. So yes, crown cranes can use in that case. I don't know about building wetlands. I'm not too sure about that. I haven't really been involved at all with that. The next question, is there a technical name for dancing of cranes? I'm not sure. I, there probably is. So to be honest, I'm not sure of the actual technical name for that. I just call it dancing. And are there any poisoning threats to cranes? Nigel, thanks for that question. The answer to that, I'm afraid there is a threat for, for cranes with poisoning. It also could be accidental or deliberate. Most of the cases I've had have just been completely accidental with the wrong use of a poison. And when it's deliberate most of the time people also targeting other bird species such as your geese and then your, your cranes land up getting affected by it. Also through education we are also informing people on farms not to use the incorrect use of poisons. Rianon, thanks for your question there. How high can cranes fly? Sure. Okay, yeah, they, they can fly high because what happens sometimes people even call them birds that can call the rain because they can fly very high and they right up in the sky. I've actually seen them myself just before a thunderstorm where they're flying right up in the sky. You can hardly ever see them. They just, you just hear them far up and people can actually hear them from far as well. And do wind farms also impact cranes like they do other species and bats? We are conducting research. The Endangered Wildlife Trust is conducting research on that. Be not totally sure at the moment what impact they have on that. So, but they will be at the same level of that and through my colleagues working the Western Cape on those projects can tell us more about that. And I see the second question by Eleanor Mary as well. Thanks for that question as well. Also about do wind turbines pose a threat to cranes? And Eleanor, your next question, are, cranes are there crane species that migrate? The answer in that question is yes. 
the the ones from for example your sandhill cranes in america they migrate sure far from the northern part of america downwards towards well, as far as places like florida so that is one of the species that can migrate i call your blue cranes uh basically a local migrant because they what happens because they breed in the in the summertime they can then fly from there to go out to the, the wintering grounds which could be 30 40 kilometers so so in that case local migrants uh, what are the cultural beliefs about cranes in south africa christine thanks for that question i don't know if you mean by the effect of you know what do people believe in south africa what cranes can do or all that but i can tell you they've got very important heritage in the zulu and Xhosa culture both of them that they are very they they are very well respected birds in both cultures okay are those all the questions any more questions going to come through Thank you, Lisa. Okay. Okay, if you guys have any more questions, please, we've got the email address that is available for you guys to, answer, to, to ask more questions. We'll answer them. So, Ali, your next question, I know mercury was found in eggshells or wattle cranes. Any follow-up on that? I'm afraid I don't have information on that, but it's a very good question you're answering there. I'd like to do some more research on that. So please supply me with your email address when you email me and I will get back to you on that question. Okay. I think that's everything. Okay. Thanks everyone. Um, I think if there's no more questions, that's um, great. Thank you for your positive feedbacks. And um, I'm glad you learned something new. Um, thank you very much. Um, Joining us.